This is Mark Sign, the minister of the Northfield Church of Christ in Northfield, New Jersey. And these are the evening services for uh, Sunday, January the 30th. Uh, because of our abundant snowfall, these are the only Sunday services for the 30th of January. So uh, hopefully for some of you, this is your Sunday worship service. We will be singing a few songs and observing the Lord's Supper, and uh, we will uh, hopefully present a lesson to you that's uh, enlightening, beneficial, and that you can uh, take with you this evening. And so from Songs of Faith and Praise, if you would turn your books to number 457, 457. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? You who unto Jesus for refuge have fled, fear not, I am with thee, oh, be not dismayed. I, I am thy God, and will still give thee aid. I'll strengthen thee, help thee, and cause thee to stand upheld by my gracious, omnipotent hand. Thus, so that on Jesus has leaned for repose, I will not, I will not desert to his foes. That soul, though all hell, should endeavor to shake. I'll never, no, never, no, never forsake. Number nine oh nine nine hundred and nine. Let's sing verses one and three of this song. One and three. There's a fountain free, tis for you and me. Let us haste, oh haste to its brink. Tis the fount of love from the source above, and he bids us all freely drink. Will you come? Will you come to, to the, the fountain free? Will you Will you come, tis for you and me? Thirsty soul, thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. There's a rock that's cleft and no soul is left that may not its pure water share. Tis for you and me and this stream I see. Let us hasten joyfully there. Will you come? 
will you come to, to the, the fountain, fountain free? Will you come? Will you come? Tis for you and me. Thirsty soul, thirsty soul, hear the welcome call. Tis a fountain open for all. And before the Lord's Supper, uh, let's turn to number 366. Three sixty six. <clears throat> By Christ redeemed in Christ restored, we keep the supper of the word and show the death of our dear Lord until he come. His body given in our stead is seen in this memorial bread. And as we drink, we see the blood until he come. And thus that dark betrayal night, with the last advent we unite, by one bright chain of loving pride until he come. One of the reasons that we gather together on the first day of the week, and we gather for uh, many reasons, but one of the reasons is that uh, we've been instructed to break bread together, and that is to commemorate uh, the Lord's Supper, uh, as it was done 2,000 years ago, that was instituted by Jesus himself, that was uh, repeated and reiterated by the Apostle Paul in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And we know that uh, uh, when they sat around the table, uh, Jesus explained some things to his disciples, and thus he explained them to us. He explained to them that he was to die and he was to leave them. And uh, as we think about that, uh, 2,000 years later, we know that this indeed did happen. And so on the first day of the week, we commemorate uh, that glorious part of your plan that you sent Jesus to us in human form, that he was susceptible to all things that humans are susceptible to. And he was indeed susceptible to the pain and the agony and even the mental anguish uh, that he suffered uh, by dying. But in his dying, he was the perfect sacrifice. He was the sacrifice one time for all. And uh, it is that sacrifice that we are thinking of right now. And so when we think that uh, being Christians is difficult sometime. Think of what Jesus went through as he sacrificed himself for us. Uh, let's pray over the bread. With this bread, dear Heavenly Father, we uh, uh, just think about your body as it hung in pain on that cruel cross. Uh, we know that uh, you sacrificed uh, your body that we might live, that you gave uh, yourself up so that uh, that sacrifice may be lasting, that through that sacrifice, that we would have the opportunity for eternal life. As we partake of this bread, let's think of your son's broken body. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen.
We know that Jesus bled from his head where the thorn of crowns was, from his hands where the nails were driven into the cross, and from his feet. We know that he was stabbed in the side and his blood flowed out. And for us, uh, that blood is, uh, is what indeed washes away our sins. As the song says, there's, there's power in the blood. And so as we partake of this fruit of the vine, let's think of the life-giving blood that flowed from uh, our Savior's body just for us. Let's pray. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to in all ways uh, remember uh, your Son's perfect sacrifice, that uh, the blood that he shed was uh, the blood of the New Testament, the blood that washes our sins away. Help us to understand it is through that blood that we have forgiveness of sins and be ever mindful of that as we journey through our lives. Be with us as we partake. We pray this prayer in his most holy name. Amen. And also on the first day of the week, we are uh, uh, required to lay by and store that with which we have been blessed, with the knowledge that all good things come from the Lord, with the knowledge that when we pass from this life to the next, that nothing that we have here physically will remain, that um, it is an ashes to ashes and dust to dust. And... Uh, Help us to understand that, that what we give, we give for a reason. We give because the church is an agent for change in the world. It's an agent for bringing others to Christ. It's an agent for helping those who are in need. So help us as we give to be mindful of all those things. Let's pray. Let us give to your Heavenly Father with a joyful and open heart. Let us be grateful that we have the opportunity to give and help us, dear Heavenly Father, to purpose what we give. Help us to understand that the church depends on uh, the offering so that it can do the work that uh, Jesus intended for it to do on this earth. Bless us in our giving. We pray this in his most holy name. Amen. And the last song that we're going to sing, the song before the lesson, is number 538. We'll sing verses 1 and 2. Verses 1 and 2. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his lovely face, I rest his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds with him the veil. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Thank you for participating in the song service uh, this evening. You may have noticed a, a kind of recurring theme during these songs. It seems to have 
do with foundations and with building. And uh, uh, last week, I think it was about Thursday or Friday, I did a devotional, a Sunday morning email devotional about how we build. And so I would like to expand that into a lesson this evening that I hope will be uh, beneficial to each one of us. If we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11, we will be at the text of this lesson. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 11. According to the grace of God, which is given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation, and another is building on it. But each man must be careful how he builds on it, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. You know, uh, uh, we live in a home, uh, whether it's an apartment, a mobile home, a house, and it is a building. And uh, it's a building that is designed to last. The house that I live in, was built in 1966. So if you count the years, uh, you can uh, see how old our building is. Since then, we have made renovations to our uh, our building, our home. We've changed the garage into a living room. We've added a room out in the back and a foyer. Uh, we've done all these things to make our building look good and feel good and be beneficial to each one of us. But um, I'm not really talking about buildings this morning, although I think the analogy is well taken. I'm talking about building ourselves up, building ourselves up individually as individual Christians and collectively as a church. And in that, notice the Apostle Paul's words, that we must be careful how we build. This building, uh, our building, uh, it has to withstand the rigors of nature, the winds and the storms. And so it is with our spiritual lives. Our spiritual lives must uh, withstand the rigors of the world. If we're hoping to leave this world and go into the next world, into eternal life, we have to be careful how we build this spiritual building. First, let us consider the cost. In Luke chapter 14, verses 28 to 30, Luke, uh, Jesus said, which one of you, when he builds a house, does not sit down and count the cost to complete it? Otherwise, he will be scorned. Uh, there's nothing sadder than, uh, on, on some level, than a person starting to build a building and running out of money. I've seen a few of those in my life. Uh, there they are, half built, and uh, it, it would be too expensive to tear down what's already there. We don't have enough money to build it, and there it is, subject to the uh, rigors of nature, and the reality of it is it did not serve its intended purpose. And so with that, uh, let's talk about our Christian life. Uh, the church uh, was built upon Jesus Christ. And so Jesus explained to us about what the cost of being a Christian is. In Matthew 10, verse 37, he said, you have to love me more than family. And in Luke 14, 26, he said that uh, we have to uh, love Jesus more than we actually love our own life. We all can quote Matthew 6, 33, where Jesus makes the ultimate priority in his life, in our lives, when he says, seek first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added unto you. 
the Apostle Paul in uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 1, said, Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to the Lord. In Matthew 6, verse 24, it says that we are called to cross bear and we need to die uh, to ourselves. We need to deny ourselves. We have our own crosses that we must bear if we are to be what the Lord wants us to be. If we're to count the cost, part of the cost comes in work. I don't mean the nine to five. I mean, uh, I mean in Philippians chapter two, where uh, the apostle Paul says that we were to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. How often must we work our salvation out every moment of every day? Every moment of every day, we are to live our lives the way the Lord expects us to live. It means giving up things that we might not have wanted to give up. But we do it because we know it's part of the cost that comes with the desire to live eternally with the Lord. In the Great Commission in Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, he said that we were to go out to all the world, teaching them to observe all, observe all things I have taught. We're to teach Jesus in our lives. That comes at a cost. You can't teach something that you don't know. As a lifetime educator, I certainly know that. You could never go into a class in front of 25 or 30 students cold, not knowing what you were going to talk about and how you were going to try to teach the things that you wanted to teach. It took sacrifice. It took time. It took time to construct a lesson by which you would get what you wanted across. And we're all called to be teachers. And finally, and this is the last thing on my list of cost, and that is that uh, it costs us every Sunday morning, doesn't it? Now, uh, on our way to church, uh, very often we pass the golf courses and see people at the golf courses. We know that there are people that are laying on the beaches in the summertime. Uh, we know that there are folks uh, out uh, having a leisurely breakfast at their favorite breakfast place. And it's not that we can't do these things, but not when the Lord calls us to worship. And in uh, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25, uh, it, the Hebrew writer says quite uh, clearly to not forsake the assembling of the saints together. And uh, a, a, a scripture that we often quote uh, about the Lord's Supper that we know that on uh, according to Acts chapter 20 verse 7 they gathered together on the first day of the week to break bread and so first when we build we must consider the cost notice in 1 Corinthians 3 10 uh, Paul said that we must be a wise builder a wise builder. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 27, we have the wise builder uh, contrasted with the unwise builder uh, or the foolish builder, the one who built his house upon the rock and the one who built his house upon the sand. And we know, again, that our houses must stand the rigors of nature, and by that same token, a, a wise builder understands that we are to buttress ourselves in the word of God and in the teachings of Jesus so that we will be wise that our buildings, our self, our physical and spiritual persona have been built in a wise manner that 
Paul talked about in 1 Corinthians 3.10, that we are indeed a wise builder. Third, we need to follow a wise plan. You know, in all my days of teaching, every week we were to turn in what we call lesson plans. And in those lesson plans, we were to outline what we were going to teach each day and what the objectives were of uh, each of those lessons. In the actual building process, when we build buildings, we call these plans blueprints. Well, you know what? Our Bibles are, are our blueprint. We are to build our spiritual lives upon the Word of God. Very, very clearly, when uh, the Apostle Paul wrote this to his protege Timothy in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 15 to 17, he uh, explained how important the Word of God is and was that what it did, it was for rebuke and reproof, so, so that all may know the truth. We, we need to know what's in our Bibles. When we read our Bibles, you know, according to the first Psalm, it, it says, I delight in the law of the Lord, and on this law do I meditate day and night. You ever wonder why uh, some of these people on the quiz show Jeopardy answer so many questions? They've done a lot of reading. This stuff did not come into their heads by osmosis. It came into their heads because they did massive amount of reading and were able to retain that which they read. And so scripture is the only thing for us to follow if we are to follow a wise plan. And you know what? Uh, there is a penalty involved if we don't know the plan. There's a penalty for making any change in this plan. According to Galatians chapter 1, verse 8 and 9, it says, No matter who preaches to you, if it is contrary to the gospel, let him be accursed. Our Bibles are our source book. They are the Holy Spirit-inspired words that have been written for us to guide our lives. Next, we need to build on a good foundation, a stable foundation. Remember in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11, he says, for no man can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. The foundation of our life is our belief in Jesus Christ. We, we can't skirt that issue that issue is of the utmost importance to us when we think of how we build our lives. Uh, the, the stability of our building obviously depends on the foundation with Jesus as the only one that we are to build upon when it comes to spiritual matters. You know, if I want to learn how to hit a baseball, I don't need to go to the Bible. All right. Uh, if if I want to learn how to bake a cake or cook something, I don't have to go to the Bible. But it, when it comes to the matters of right and wrong in this world, of what things are acceptable to the Lord and what things are unacceptable to the Lord, we only have one source, and that source is the Word of God. And you know what? Um, in uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 20, it tells us that Jesus is the cornerstone of the church. All right? And so when we talk about the foundation 
which is laid, that is Jesus Christ. It is Jesus as the cornerstone, both of the church and the cornerstone of our life. You know, builders uh, very often make bids on uh, things uh, if they are going to build homes or additions to homes. And uh, uh, the, the bids that they put in are based upon several things. They're based upon the manpower that they have, and they are based upon um, the hours that it will take. And then last but not least, they are based upon the materials that are used. When I make take my car in to have it worked on, there is a labor charge, and then there is a list of the parts that were used in my vehicle uh, to get the work done that had to get done. And we need to use the best of materials. We can't put fleshly materials into a spiritual body. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 to 21, deeds of the flesh are evident. If you want to see those, there are 9 or 10 or 11 of these deeds of the flesh. And uh, Paul lists immorality, impurity, idolatry, sorcery, dissension, factions. There are more. And he says, these aren't the things that you are supposed to be involved in when you build up your spiritual body. And so he goes right on into verses 22 and 23. And he says, these are the ones, the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. He says, don't get involved in those nasty things because they will drag you down. Uh, you have to build with the best of materials. And the best that we have to offer are these virtues that are listed in Galatians 5 verse 22 and 23. With that, let's conclude the lesson this evening. Um, you know, uh, we can build a building for somebody else. We can use shoddy materials, perhaps. And maybe, maybe we can get away with it. You know, uh, we see all the time... Um, bridges, uh, roads that outlive their, uh, I, I'm going to get redundant here, their longevity. If, if there is a bridge over salt water and the salt water keeps going by the material that the bridge is made out of, that's part of the bridge that's down in the water is going to be subject to that. And with that, we need to understand that we have to use the best of materials. We see buildings, roads getting rebuilt all the time because there is a longevity to them. But in our building, in our spiritual building, nothing can be hidden. We can't hide it underwater. We can't hide it in the walls of the house. We can't use an interior, a, a, a shoddy material, and then cover it with something, with some veneer, and make it look really, really good. It just, it just won't work. Many years ago, um, uh, I have always been a baseball fan, but uh, as a young person, uh, I went to uh, this uh, store and uh, they were selling baseballs, very cheap. Uh, now, I, I have to take you back into the 50s. And there was this beautiful white baseball and they wanted 79 cents for the baseball, which was a fairly good sum back then. But I thought, man, the use I'm going to get out of this baseball 
for just 79 cents is just going to be amazing. So we, uh, me and my best friend, we took the ball out and we threw it around a little bit, but then the proof came in the pudding and uh, got a bat out and he threw the ball to me and the ball made an odd sound when I hit it. And when we retrieved the ball, it was lopsided. Baseballs don't do that. Baseballs are a small piece of rubber wrapped with twine very tightly and with a horsehide uh, outer covering on them that's also very tight. Not designed to get lopsided. Well, after we whacked it around a little while, the strings came loose and finally we realized that this was a useless baseball. We tore it apart and in it was newspaper. This was in the early 50s when things made in Japan were inferior things, not as the superior things that they are today. I, when I pulled the newspaper out, it was Japanese print. You see, they thought they could hide <laughs> something from somebody by selling it cheaply. And what you got was something cheap. In our lives, nothing can be hidden. Cain couldn't hide from the Lord. Adam couldn't hide from the Lord. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 3, it says, The eyes of the Lord are everywhere. And in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, it said, And there is no creature hidden from his sight, and all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of the Lord. Let's remember, we need to build up our spiritual body and we need to take heed how we build. We need to just count the cost. We need to use uh, the best of materials. We need to use the proper guidelines. We need to build on a good foundation. We need to follow a wise plan. Only then will our spiritual lives be what they're supposed to be. If you haven't come to the Lord as yet, we offer the invitation to you that uh, you need to get into God through Jesus Christ by confessing Jesus as the Son of God, repenting of your former ways and being baptized for the remission of your sins. If you need that, uh, I don't think we'll be able to get out to you this evening, but we will be there at your beck and call as soon as we possibly can. If you need to confess your sins one to another, we are there uh, to be that person that you can confess to, and you can always confess those sins to the Lord. If you are subject to the imitation of Jesus Christ uh, and need to respond, uh, this would be the time. Let's pray together as we close. Our God and Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for the time that we've had together this evening. Bless us in our study. Help us as we look at this lesson to understand that we are a spiritual building and it is our hope that we will leave this life here on earth as physical creatures and, and live with you eternally as spiritual beings. But we know we'll only do that if we live our lives the way you want us to live them. Help us, dear Heavenly Father, to live godly lives. Help us to take your word as our guide as the lamp to our way. Bless us this evening. Help us to, uh, uh, help us to uh, be comforted by uh, your goodness and help us to be of comfort to others. Bless us and be with us. I pray this prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Please be safe. May God bless you all. Sing grace, how sweet the sound.